nurse practitioner and I have seen the difference between delivering a baby emergently in an emergency situation within the ER versus delivering in the hospital where care is optimal. I believe that's extremely risky and yes the physicians are trained to deliver babies that is part of their training however the emergency room does not offer fetal monitoring the, the provider that's delivering the child in an emergency case doesn't know the prenatal history and they're just not able to provide the quality of care that I believe women and infants should receive which increases the risk of um, mortality so I think having that convenient close to home location for women to deliver babies safely is absolutely should be the standard of care I, I, this is a this is the question, right? This is the essence of the question, um, and I'm so grateful to have a, an expert panel to start to try to get into the layers of this because um, it's not an it's not an easy question, and we don't actually understand all of the factors that go into this. Um, we try really hard to look at research that has already been done both in the United States and outside of the United States regarding where should labor and deliveries be and what should labor and deliveries offer um, and how does that impact the outcome of patients. We know a couple of things. Um, one is that if you're in an urban setting, you are closer to a, a labor and delivery unit, we think you have better outcomes. <clears throat> if you're in a rural setting, uh, if you have, let me back up, if you have low volume care in your labor and delivery, we're not sure that's actually associated with better outcomes. And that's where this needs to be um, researched more. Uh, and that's where we need to ensure that women are at the table of research studies. <laughs> because this is a huge question we should know the answer to and we actually don't. Um, and so trying to get through this layer is where I think a lot of the attention should be focused. Um, we, in, the, in the list of questions we got, one of the questions was about home birth. And we actually don't even know the answer to really to how safe is home birth within the United States um, because we don't have a good control group. We can't necessarily randomize people to either being at home or being not at home. Even in the UK, they haven't randomized people. It's still been a choice, which goes back to women needing to have choice around what they're going to do and what they feel is safest for them. Um, and so this is the complicated question. I'm, I'm super interested in other people's ideas around how we can get to the answer of this. I think one uh, thing ab about this question is there is always this debate, and, and frankly, we're talking about labor and delivery, but this is true across almost any complex hospital service, and, and that is how much volume is required to uh, create an environment where safe care can be delivered. And, you know, frankly, that, that often uh, equates to uh, the economies of scale uh, around uh, the, the financial uh, viability. Um, I think what is universally true though, and we see this throughout our region, is <laughs> prenatal care is absolutely essential to producing good outcomes. And so, you know, we can, you, you can focus a lot of conversation around the presence or absence of labor and delivery units in specific communities. What is universally true is that people throughout our region uh, need to have access to good prenatal care. We see it uh, in our hospitals uh, all the time. There is a clear link uh, between good prenatal care and good outcomes. And I think that's uh, a challenge from an access issue given the, the, the travel times between facilities. So. We've chosen to respond to that by, by in, in as much as we can, by having those services as close to people as possible. So, you know, recently a, a lot of press around 
uh, Angel Medical uh, dis uh, Center's decision to close labor and delivery. I don't have a comment about that. Uh, we know that a number of those uh, uh, patients are going to come to Harris Regional Hospital. What we've wanted not to do, though, is take for granted uh, that fact, number one. And then number two, we want to make sure that the prenatal care they need to get is as close to them as possible. So to that end, we have an outpatient facility in Franklin uh, where we've opened a full-time OB office so that we can take those patients in and make it convenient. Uh, for them to receive that care. So I would say that, you know, again, the, a lot of the conversation may be about where is a labor and delivery unit located, but uh, without question, access to prenatal care is a big issue in terms of healthy outcomes. So, excuse me, our, our strategy um, as a hospital system, we, uh, we own uh, 12 physician practices and employ all of the physicians and the folks who work in those, in those 12 practices. And with um, this for this particular service line, uh, women's and children's care, we have chosen to regionalize those practices um, by locating um, our Harris Women's Care, which is our OBGYN practice um, in Franklin full-time, in Silva full-time, in Bryson City on a, a rotating basis. And then we have um, full-time pediatrics in Bryson City, Silva, and Franklin now. Um, so that is a strategy to, uh, to address kind of the broad uh, net of population that exists here in Western North Carolina across these, these 19 counties. And I guess as we sit here today, I might draw a parallel. You know, we're sitting in a Lenore Rhine University building, and I'm pretty sure Lenore Rhine is in Hickory. Um, yet it, as an institution, has chosen to uh, expand and, and have a location here to serve people in this area who, who want to attend. So, I guess I would just draw that parallel um, and note the importance of regionalization when we talk about that prenatal care and um, serving people where they live. I'd like to add something to that. Is there's been a lot of research that looks at prenatal care through telehealth or telemedicine, and I believe that is a cutting edge opportunity for people, no matter what their geographic location is, to receive very good quality health care from a provider. And I do believe that telehealth is going to make excellent strides in helping Western North Carolina. Just as we, the parallel is we are being live streamed to different hospitals, there's some amazing things in research that really validates prenatal care and the importance of how well telehealth can help reduce negative outcomes. One thing I would mention, uh, for those of you who have not had a chance to read our story yet, uh, this issue is one that's discussed in depth, certainly by some health professionals, but also from the point of view of uh, patients or people who are soon to be patients, uh, particularly in the labor and delivery situation. And we didn't necessarily solicit a particular type of comment uh, from those patients, but there seemed to be a very unanimous answer uh, to the question that people wanted not to have to travel, particularly people who said, I can go from Spruce Pine to Marion, but have you seen the road from Spruce Pine to Marion? And imagine if we interviewed a woman who gave birth uh, in January during a snowstorm, who lived five minutes in the Spruce Pine Hospital, but it took her half an hour because mm. it, it happened to be you know, in, in, in horrible weather. Imagine trying to do that, and it was, uh, there were some cases we talked about where they had emergency C-sections, so when you have complications, mm -hmm. it's even more serious. I think that access is one of the things that is a deep concern to people who, who fear for a situation you can't always predict mm -hmm. what kind of complications could arise. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to get the perception of, of the patients as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I want to ask you guys, we know healthcare has been in the national political spotlight. We know that's affecting the economic situation uh, for healthcare providers, uh, including hospitals. Obviously, there's some things that are unpredictable, but you have an economic climate that we have at the moment, even if it's, it's a little bit unpredictable. What sorts of pressures are facing hospitals right now that are prompting some to consider reducing rural facilities? And just in particular, are some of those factors worse in our region, uh, in Western North Carolina, in the mountains, uh, both due to political and, and regional factors? Well, certainly, 
there are economic pressures on hospitals that probably everybody in this room has heard uh, a lot of people talk about. So, you know, we operate in an era of declining reimbursement, um, trying to balance cost structure against reimbursement, and, uh, and really, uh, at the same time, trying to expand access to care uh, for the populations uh, that, that you serve. There is a disproportionate impact on rural America around access to care, uh, around the payer mix that supports uh, the financial viability of facilities. And I think a lot of the current uh, you know, debate that is going on probably doesn't really get at the heart you know, of, the, of the problem. So North Carolina was one of the states that didn't expand Medicaid. And, and uh, you know, whatever political position you have about that, from a hospital operator's perspective, what you know is that more people with coverage is a better thing. It's, it's, uh, it's a better thing for the hospital. It's a better thing for a community. And, and on balance, it's a better thing uh, for the individual. Now, there are lots of complexities uh, inside how does that get paid for? And, I, you know, I think, you know, unfortunately, the current debate at a national level um, is really not at the heart of the matter. I, I think having uh, a really good debate around what is the federal government's role in the provision of health care, I think that's a great question to, to ask. What should, at, and at what cost? And quite frankly, uh, who uh, should bear the responsibility to, for the provision of health care for economically disadvantaged people, which is a, a problem, a challenge that disproportionately affects rural America and western North Carolina. So I would love to see those questions put front and center you know, as opposed to debating on which plan is going to cut coverage to the fewest or most people. Um, that's really not getting at the heart uh, of the, the, the debate. But that said, those challenges are creating existential uh, questions for hospitals uh, in rural uh, uh, locales across the country. I think to put some numbers on it, um for, for our hospitals, um, about a fifth of the patients we take care of um, have, have Medicaid, and, and then about a fifth of the uh, patients in our in our service area have, have no insurance, zero. So when you're talking about getting that prenatal care, I mean, insurance is but one issue that a patient needs to consider, um, especially in, in a rural area, because there's uh, time away from work. I mean, if, if there is a place to work, uh, there's gas money. Um, so, you know, all of these things factor into the into the discussion that we probably don't see on the national scale. But these are the kinds of things that, that we talk about locally here in the region. 50% of the births in this country are covered by Medicaid. That's a national number. 59%, that number jumps up to 59% in rural regions. So in our region, 59% of the births are covered by Medicaid. Um, Medicaid covers birth um, at um, a rate that's probably maybe okay for a, an incre incredibly uncomplicated prenatal care delivery and postpartum <laughs> care, and Medicaid only covers to that postpartum visit, which is four or six weeks. So that has nothing beyond a four or six week time frame for that mom in terms of her health care after a delivery, which isn't, well, I, will, uh, I won't say too much. Um, <laughs> so that, in general, and, and I'm sure you see this from the hospital level, um, trying to provide service to patients e that are even a slightly bit complicated, you end up providing more service than what you're getting paid by Medicaid. Um, and so then if you add on to it a state that didn't expand Medicaid, that makes that very difficult. Um, and it's just, a, it is an economic part of the debate that is, again, like these are multiple layers of, of the question, um, but the rural part of Western North Carolina economically 
has increased uh, needs, um, and that creates healthcare needs that are not being addressed on multiple levels. Um, and again, for the whole family and the mom and that child. And resources really need to be focused on preventative care. And so if you're not providing women with preventative care and excellent prenatal care, then the cost significantly increases tenfold. So if you have a baby that's born prematurely at 35 weeks gestation, then you the increase of cost is 10 times greater. So a difference of $4,700 for an infant born at 35 weeks versus $400 for a term baby. So I just believe that if you can really focus in on the preventative care and really good prenatal care, and prevention, regardless of where the child is delivered, then the health care cost is decreased. I want to get back to this issue of maternal mortality that, that, uh, that we were talking about uh, recently. And, um, you know, uh, we're the only developed uh, country with a rising rate of maternal mortality. Um, and I wonder uh, if, if you could speak to what extent uh, you think these sort of barriers to access to care um, you know, contribute to that if there's some tertiary factor that's affecting both. Um, you know, and if you are, uh, you know, someone who, if you're a pregnant woman, you know, what can you really, uh, really do if you're you're in a situation where you don't have have close access to care to uh, to to get the best services for yourself and to to sort of protect yourself from some of these outcomes? I believe communication with the patient provider relationship is one of the most vital keys to a healthy pregnancy and reduce uh, morbidity and mortality. So I would just encourage uh, pregnant women or women who are considering becoming pregnant to go to their provider right now and say, here's what I'm facing. Um, with the loss, you know, say they're covered by, by Blue Cross Blue Shield, what am I going to do in the next six to nine months with my care? Where am I going to deliver? How can I make the best choices for our family to ensure um, help for mom and baby? So that communication, I feel like, is, is vital in coming together in your specific region with your specific risks and lay that out on the table and create a plan. Um, women who experience more stress and anxiety during pregnancy are more likely to have preterm babies, um, stillbirths, many multiple complications. So the more you can reduce the stress, reduce the, the driving conditions, you know, if it looks like it's going to be bad weather, having a plan already in place for how to get to the hospital in the, you know, should delivery occur during that time frame. So I believe just planning as much as you can, but we know you can't plan everything when you're having a baby. You had a lot of things in that Sorry. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I'll start with, I think, your the first part of your question was about maternal mortality rising. Infant mortality rising is also rising. Um, and there are a lot of things that go into that. Obviously, the United States' um, lack of uh, attention to preventative care is causing there to be increased health care risks for each individual. So we're talking about uh, heart attack risk, obesity, um, high blood pressure, diabetes, all of these things which are part of a bigger picture are playing into the role of the mom's health before pregnancy, during pregnancy, after pregnancy, and that whole family. Um, healthcare disparities are very significant piece of our concern and issues in this, in Buncombe County and in our whole region. Where there's health disparities economically and there's health disparities racially. Um, and we need to address both. And we need to understand that behind those disparities is institutions um, that have been economically driven uh, instead of being able to kind of like get to the preventative care um, and truly address racial inequities within the institutions uh, within our understanding of social determinants of health. And without us addressing that, we're not going to be able to see this turnaround. One of the things, as we talk about disparities regionally, one of the things that we're lacking in Western North Carolina, as, as compared to some other parts of the state, uh, which are famous for having an abundance of these, are uh, medical universities. Uh, 
you all are affiliated uh, with Duke University, of course, uh, with your organization. Um, but we don't have a medical school in this part of the state. I think the closest one is Wake Forest uh, in Winston-Salem. Uh, we have some good health-related programs at universities. And of course, uh, your hospital in Silva is in essentially a university town, probably in Western Carolina University here, just outside <laughs> Silva. Um, <coughs> Is that a factor that affects the ability to get good health providers to come to the area? Uh, yeah. Is there a need for additional medical training in this part of the state? And what is being done that, that might help that? Can I just clarify that um, Asheville campus has medical students from UNC. That's true. Sure. Um, and, and actually the reason it was developed was to uh, encourage providers to stay in this region. Um, and Mayhek has a state appropriation to actually expand that, right. which is a huge part of our whole regional understanding of how to move forward through this problem. The entire region, so all throughout all of the healthcare systems of these 19 counties, there's over 200 providers that have an affiliation with our medical school training med students for this area. And uh, working again within the entire region and all the healthcare systems moving through the pipeline. So um, rural high school students are getting um, into programs to be able to ultimately apply to medical school, be accepted to the UNC medical school, either in Asheville or uh, in Chapel Hill, and then continue to move through the state uh, and stay in our region. Um, so that is definitely an important part of solving the problem and something that the entire region is working on. Um, I think there is more to be done in terms of pipeline and, and kind of, you know, using all of our regional resources to continue to um, encourage providers to stay. I don't, I'm sure you guys see that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, whether or not Western North Carolina can, can support, you know, a full-on medical school, I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I think that Mayhek has done an incredible job of expanding its residency programs and you know coincidentally several of us were just at Mayhek last week uh, meeting with residents uh, about what their career plans are and uh, I think Mayhek has done an incredible job of selecting residents into their uh, programs who have um, at least a stated intention of uh, wanting to practice in rural communities and so I know that it is a goal of the Mayhek program to have as many of those residents practicing uh, in Western North Carolina as possible. Out in our neck of the woods at Western Carolina University, they, uh, the, the university has developed a nurse practitioner program. We uh, sponsor uh, individuals to go through the nurse practitioner program so we pay for them to go through the program and then offer them employment uh, on the back end of their training and I would say that uh, whether it's a medical school uh, specifically or not anything that we can do that expands training occurring in our region for uh, people who are going to take care of patients once they finish their training uh, the better uh, off we are. We, we do know that folks who train in a rural setting are most uh, more likely to practice in a rural setting. I think, uh, again, both Mayhek and Western Carolina have done uh, a fantastic job of putting programs together to support that. We're also really fortunate to be in a part of the country that, that does draw um, people who are interested in, in, in practicing medicine here. Um, Again, just since the beginning of the year, um, we have recruited or hired 14 um, providers, physicians, or um, nurse practitioners, or physician assistants. Five of those are in this service line, the women's and, and children's care service line. So there's an OBGYN physician, a pediatrician, and then three certified nurse midwives to help with the deliveries. Um, we have historically, I, I think we're just fortunate to uh, um, all of us live in the area that, that we live in here, out in Silva and, and Bryson City. Um, we have historically had um, luck and success recruiting um, physicians of all specialties to our, to our area and they tend to stay because they are focused on that rural model of, of care and it means a lot to them to see their patients in the grocery store care for an entire patient's family from you know, zero to um, the geriatric years. I, I, I will comment that uh, what Lucretia said 
does highlight a more national problem. We are blessed to be here in Western North Carolina where uh, a lot of people want to come uh, to practice and to live. Uh, LifePoint hospitals, you know, we're a part of Duke LifePoint. Well, the LifePoint side of that operates 72 hospitals in rural communities uh, across the country, I think in 23 states. And when I talk to my colleagues, uh, they don't have nearly as easy a time recruiting providers into their rural communities. So while I think in some cases in Silva, Franklin, Bryson City, uh, we have the experience of being very successful uh, in recruiting providers into our rural locations, that is not the case across the country. Uh, there, there are uh, some hospitals within our system that may go a year or two in, in between recruiting a single provider into that community. It's not because there's anything wrong with the hospital. It's not because uh, it's, it, it's not a nice place. It's because it's in a place where populations by and large may be choosing not to live. And that's a national challenge. And, and part of what contributes to these disparities that we talk about between rural America and urban America. I am a graduate of Western Carolina University, so I am very pleased with the fact that they really focus on training people from Western North Carolina in the rural healthcare. I mean, we, we study rural healthcare. Our clinicals are done in the rural healthcare sites in hopes to have us stay there, because just like you mentioned, over 50% of providers who are trained in that state will stay in the state. Well, I would really like to see them stay in the rural counties and communities where they are trained. So I would even encourage everyone sitting in this room as a professional to go to the next generation in high schools and really try to encourage them to further their education locally because if you were born and raised in that county, you are going to know the specific health care needs and be more likely to go back into that area to serve. So I just truly believe that if we can increase the opportunity, the training resources here locally for physicians, physicians assistants, and nurse practitioners that we'll see a lot more um, opportunities for health care in the smaller uh, rural counties. So in our recording, we, uh, we came across a, a slight discrepancy, and I, I wonder if maybe you can shed some light on it. Um, so, you know, we uh, focused on um, uh, closing labor and delivery in its any region, as you know, and um, Mission Health, which for people watching online is a nonprofit hospital network um, that's based in Asheville and services the region. Um, they mentioned uh, sort of a, a fewer, fewer people coming into their facilities as a, as a reason for closing down. Um, but, but other hospital networks have actually found an increase in the number of women seeking labor and delivery services. So, um, you know, I'm wondering if you can shed some light on, you know, what are you, what are you hearing from patients and from, from people uh, coming to your hospitals and, and from providers at the hospitals about um, use and, and, and any shifts in, in demographics? You know, I think uh, the specific data points are probably um, a, a matter of context. So, and, and I do think uh, all of it could be and probably is true in this, in this sense. Um, in our service area, as I said, we, we uh, serve patients from Jackson Swain, uh, Macon, uh, Graham, Cherokee, and uh, counties in into North Georgia. The, the rate of growth uh, and the growth by age sector throughout that region is not uniform. So uh, in Jackson County, where Harris Regional Hospital is located, we tend to have a younger population and the growth tends to be uh, a, a bit of a younger population. Whereas in Macon County, uh, that's not at all true. Uh, in fact, it's disproportionately the other direction, the 65 plus. Uh, age sector uh, of that population is growing much more rapidly uh, than any other segment uh, from an age perspective. So I think that uh, there's also this, this issue of uh, for a particular facility, what is your geographic footprint? So in our case, um, because we so serve a large geographic area, uh, we do see growth 
in OBGYN services across that entire geographic area. That is not necessarily true in, in, if you were isolating out each individual uh, county or location uh, with, within our service area. So I think that throughout Western North Carolina, what is uh, without question tr uh, true is that generally speaking, the population growth is occurring in the region uh, is occurring at the uh, 65 plus age range um, and there are individual variances within a 19 county region. We happen to be one of them in Jackson County because of the presence of the university and the presence of Harris Casino, you know, which are basically equal distance from uh, our hospital in, in different directions. But other areas like Macon County are, are experiencing a different reality. In Henderson County, we have seen an increase in the deliveries at our hospital at the baby place. Um, last year, we delivered, I want to say it was 600 babies in the baby place. Um, we have women that drive from Transylvania County, Polk County, Rutherford County, Upper South Carolina, and Bunko County to deliver at our hospital as well. So we, we have not seen that, but just as you brought up, it's you know, demographics do play a, an important role within your community. However, I fear that the communities that do have the majority of the population, 65 and older, if you take away young women's health services and their ability to have babies locally, then you're not growth in that community for your younger population is not going to soar. And that's a problem that I think should be looking ahead, not looking at what you have right now. You really need to look at that and really offer those services to bring in younger people that want to live in that community and raise their family there. Just to jump in too, you mentioned uh, Transylvania County and County of Bard as a destination or yes. an origin site for people. That's one of the places where one of these labor delivery units has been closed out and closed in, in 2015. Uh, but that's one of the three places where uh, Mission Health has decided to close its facilities within the last few years. So um, it, it's interesting that you're seeing traffic coming from that. Yes. Sorry for interrupting. Absolutely. I think it's a, a question of economics again, um, and that as we are, you know, our western part of our state um, to see some growth. In young families, um, would would be it, it would behoove us to look at some um, ability for some economic growth there, um, and then I think we would see a different um, scene start to develop. And, and I, I would point out at a hospital level, um, much of the decision making is around. Um, the core services that you already have in place and the incremental investment required uh, to sustain those services. So again, in the case of Harris, uh, our women's and children's service line has been uh, you know, a strength of our hospital for decades. Uh, we were already in the process of making you know, a, a $6 million investment in a new birthing center at the time uh, the mission announcement about Angel was made. Um, so the fact that that decision was made really had no bearing on our decision to invest in those services and it's really because of the historical strength uh, of the service line. So I think from a hospital planning perspective, uh, all of those things get taken into consideration as you're, you're trying to decide what incremental uh, investments you should make and you're you're trying to balance that against a more uh, a broad portfolio of services that, that uh, need to be offered uh, to to a community and, and trying to make a decision should should I offer those services or, or should we offer those services at our hospital uh, versus allowing someone else to do that and there's really no right or wrong answer at any given moment about that there's there's the best answer you know the best answer you can have uh, based on the information you have Go ahead. The, the effects are um, borne out in, in in the numbers to uh, Jacqueline's point um, there in Henderson County 
for our county, the response effect has been, um, you, you compare year over year, and so July, um, you know, we saw a 45% increase in the number of births that we had specifically from Macon County. Um, in, in August, that number was 86% increase. Um, we're not talking about enormous numbers, but um, when you look at the, at the trend, um, it, the effect is almost immediate, which you all probably saw a couple years ago. Um, so that's when we as a, as a hospital, as, as an organization, um, look at our resources and decide about the investments that we need to make to, to respond to that, to that grid, such as bringing on three certified nurse midwives within you know, the course of a, a few weeks. Um, so. I think, uh, just to echo, just that this is a regional approach to healthcare, um, that we have lots of partners. Uh, and Western North Carolina is actually lucky in hospital systems, although they're different systems, there are options that are cl fairly close to home for most patients. Um, and it just, it's a fascinating part of this question knowing that you know in Henderson County there's two hospital systems um, that can offer labor and delivery services that may have a, you know been part of why Transylvania um, Mission Health System was able to make the decision that they made knowing that there are partners nearby um, and when you look at the region from that perspective just trying to make sure that somebody has a place within reach is still possible. That's a good point, and it, they didn't address that specific situation when we talked with Mission for the article we did, but they did mention when they decided to close Angel, they said that they looked at the investment that Harris was making, right. and they realized there was going to be a place, it might not be as convenient, but there was going to be a place that, that those patients would not be at a complete loss to, to get to a place that had updated facilities. That goes to the next question I was going to ask. In addition to talking about utilization, one of the things Mission talked about that seriously with us was um, they had to make some tough decisions economically. They're building uh, new facilities, quite a big investment in Franklin County. So you know, we're talking about closure of labor and delivery, but they're actually expanding some other services and updating what they found to be um, facilities that were not in the best shape or aging facilities there. They are also expanding what they're doing in Cal County. And, and the decision to eliminate labor and delivery in Franklin County, or I'm sorry, in Franklin, in Macon County, Franklin County is in a different part of the state, um, just confusing. But anyway, um, so at Angel in Franklin, in Macon County. Um, and then uh, next to McDowell County, we have uh, Mitchell County, where the Spruce Pine uh, facility called Blue Ridge was located, uh, is located. And uh, that facility is also losing its delivery and delivery unit. They'll be losing it at the end of this month. Um, in both cases, you know, those hospital expansions played in. I guess the question, I'm a big preface to answer the question, but the question I have for you guys is it something about labor and delivery mm. in terms of cost that really makes that a, a hot one when you're looking at where it can cut? Yes. So, <laughs> it's a complicated. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't characterize it as uh, looking where we can cut. I would characterize it as balancing the investments that you can make for maximum impact to the communities you serve. And so, so I think the simple answer around the economics of the labor and delivery are that. Uh, if we look across our entire portfolio of services, uh, I think this was referenced earlier, without question, disproportionately, uh, labor and delivery uh, is a Medicaid business. Um, and so uh, that translates to lower reimbursement. Um, the costs of operating labor and delivery are relatively high. Uh, compared to other services. And so I think when any facility is going to make a decision about what investments um, it can make uh, for maximum impact to the communities uh, uh, served, I think labor and delivery 
is always going to be a challenging service line. Again, in our particular case, we already had a foundation of volume and a foundation of investment that was being made. So to make that investment seemed, uh, well, it not seemed, it, it was a natural uh, outflow of our strategic plan. I can appreciate the fact that that uh, is not going to be the answer for every single hospital in Western North Carolina or throughout the country. So I, I do think that the economics of labor and delivery, uh, relatively low in, uh, reimbursement, relatively high cost, certainly plays a, a role in making uh, a determination about can those be services be offered and duplicated at every hospital in Western North Carolina, and, you know, very simply, the answer is no. I think what's what, uh, another um, unique factor, I think, in this discussion about, about our hospital there in Silva Harris is that, um, you know, we, we do have a larger partner in Duke Life Point Healthcare, and we have been part of Duke Life Point Healthcare for the last three years. We just had our three-year anniversary on August 1st of this year. Um, but Duke Life Point came in and made a commitment to our hospitals and our community that we would build this six million dollar um, labor and delivery unit. So we recognize that um, as a unique aspect of our situation. Not everyone um, is, is affiliated with a larger partner. We could have a whole other discussion about larger partners um, and how that all works. But um, I just wanted to note that that has helped us continue to make those investments in, in the service line at a time of um, tremendous volatility in, in the region. Babies, I read somewhere that babies are unpredictable and unprofitable. <laughs> uh, which I like to think of as part of the mystery and miracle of life. Like, that is what babies are. That is the whole point, right? That's why it's a miracle when a baby comes, and, and that's why we do this. Um, the, the reality is that in order to ensure that every patient that is going to deliver their baby has the ability um, to, for that to be in the safest possible situation, meaning anesthesia available if you have to do an emergency C-section, skilled, trained, up-to-date providers for the mom, obstetrically, anesthetically, for the baby in all different ranges is actually incredibly expensive. It's not easy to be prepared for every possible situation at any time of the day or night, every single day of the year. This is an expensive thing if you're dedicated to ensuring that highest quality safety for every patient that enters. And that's again why this is such a great conversation because if you decide, like, I'm going to be prepared for anything that could possibly happen for any patient, then you are, you are holding yourself to a very high standard uh, in terms of having an expert team, an entire team of people prepared. Um, and that is really expensive and important. And yet we have to make hard decisions around how to be sure we can provide that because, you know, the, uh, the question really gets at, would it be fair to offer somebody um, something that's not quite as good? You know, that's, that, we don't want that for our daughters. We want them to know if our daughter enters or we enter or my sister enters a setting that she's going to be able to receive the best possible care in that moment that she can. And I think that that's why this is an important conversation because that is difficult to do. Follow up on that. You know, I mean, I'm hearing, uh, you know, this is a complex healthcare scenario, a lot of medical needs. Um, that describes ERs also, you know. So, what is really the difference, do you, do you think, between, um, you know, the, the calculation made in a labor delivery unit versus another expensive unit? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, uh, volume and really the cost per unit of care. So in an emergency department, uh, you know, so at our hospital, 
next year we'll probably do 800 or so deliveries, but we'll do 30,000 ER visits. And so, you know, if we did 30,000 deliveries, well, I don't know that we could do that, quite honestly. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, uh, but if we did, if we did, uh, if we did that many deliveries, um, you know, the, the economics would be different because there is a fixed cost investment that happens and it's spread over whatever units um, uh, that, that you serve. And you know, then, then to think about making an incremental investment, uh, you have to weigh all of those factors. So I, I agree with your point. I, I will say, I'll put a plug in around this Medicaid expansion issue. Uh, emergency and behavioral health. The emergency departments being overrun uh, with uh, behavioral health uh, issues and with um, with folks who simply use uh, out, out, through no fault of their own use the emergency department as primary care is something that could um, I won't say be solved it could be made better uh, by Medicaid expansion in particular so that those folks get plugged in to the healthcare system at an earlier stage and they're getting primary care where they should get primary care, not in the emergency department. There's, there's a longitudinal aspect also to women's care in terms of um, what we talked about earlier. Um, you, know, you can serve uh, one patient from you know, birth to um, pretty far down the lifespan. I think there's a question later to talk about the services outside of OB that focus on, on GYN and um, breast care and, and things. Um, for, for women um, who are not uh, consuming OB services. But the women's and children's care service line, um, we, we have the opportunity to impact about 60% of our county's populations, uh, depending on the county. If you look up, if you add up the uh, percentages of the various age groups in our counties, um, you know, on the high side, uh, we are able to touch about 60% of our county populations with that one service line alone, probably more so than, than any other service that, that we provide. So there's a longitudinal, long-standing um, feature of women's and children's care. So with that, I think we could open it up to the audience, to all of you. Um, and I, I would like to segue, perhaps, Stephen, to what you said. Dan Barron, um, who's in Yancey County, asked, what are the most pressing legislative issues that will most affect women in rural health in North Carolina? And then we'll open it to folks. And people are also texting me questions, so I'll fit those in as we can. Well, I, I would certainly be interested to hear others, but I think at, at the federal level, what's going to happen with the Affordable Care Act? You know, I think women's, because women's services uh, are such an overwhelming component of what any medical community does, anything that uh, affects generally the way health care is delivered uh, is going to affect women's and children's services. So, you know, the, the debate that is likely happening this week uh, if it is a debate, you know, about, uh, about the Affordable Care Act and, and about the uh, new legislation being proposed. And then I think in the, in the state, um, you know, an outflow of that is around this Medicaid expansion uh, question. Um, I think both of those things legislatively, from my perspective, would have the broadest impact on all services and on women's services as a subset of that. Anyone? Question? Um, yeah, I'm interested in the, um, I mean, we have the system we have, and so what your conversation has been within the system that we have. But I also heard a couple of things. I heard that our outcomes for mothers and children are not as high as they are in most developed countries. I also believe it's the case that in most of those developed countries we have a single payer universal system. I'm wondering if there's a correlation between those two. It's a really good question, right? And that's the question that we need to try to figure out. Um, I think the other thing that we don't talk about when we talk about our outcomes in the United States compared to other health payer systems is that we actually look at the demographics of which part of the United States 
patients are not doing as well as other health systems. So like if you look at infant mortality as an example, our white patients and moms and babies are actually doing about the same as in other healthcare systems like in the UK or Canada. But it's our African American patients who are so disparate that it's actually changing the number. And so I think if we're pretty careful about looking at that system and trying to understand how that system got set up and understanding it um, as, a, as a bigger question, then we could start to unravel where we need to focus some of our attention. Um, and single-payer system would probably, I mean, it would change some of the discussion that we're having, but if we're still in this same system that is set up to be disparate, um, and with racial inequalities, then it's not necessarily going to make that number different. Does that, does that make sense? There also has to, there also has to be a balance um, with uh, managing healthcare costs. And um, I think there's a lot of discussion right now out there locally about uh, rising drug costs and equipment costs and, and, and salaries to make sure that we retain the highest talent that we can within our organization. So, there are multiple discussions that occur around that around that great question. Well, I think the, the only thing that I would add to that is one of the uh, challenges I think that we face. So to, to your question, you know, I, I would say that perhaps the universal system, uh, it, it would certainly narrow, I think, uh, expected outcome. Now, then you get into a debate about does the expected outcome meet our expectations? And this is a uniquely American issue in that we have become predisposed to consume healthcare like we order a Big Mac at McDonald's. And, and that therein lies a, a really fundamental challenge. Um, a lot of those systems clearly ration care um, and I'm not here to say I'm for or against that. I'm simply saying they, they ration care. And so um, to, to answer that question, we would ultimately have to get to the point of uh, understanding how a system would deliver care uh, at the time someone needs it or thinks they need it. And what we know is that there are studies indicating that 30% of the healthcare consumed in our country, uh, upwards of a trillion dollars a year, goes for no effect. No effect on outcome, no effect on the patient experience, no effect on uh, lengthening life and, uh, you know, I, and, and improving the quality of life. And so I think that's a pretty fundamental question that would have to be answered in that broader context of a, of a single payer system. I'm a preventive nurse practitioner, and I think we've missed one point here, with three, and that is that true primary care begins with diet. And even in Asheville, in a section where I'm frequently volunteering, there are kids at night who knock on doors to, to ask for a piece of bread and look at the whole of the 19 regions. Um, one question that came in from Susan is when you separate prenatal care from delivery site, don't you undermine the confidence and relationship of the patient with their doctor? There's a lot of research, and I'm sure that has some great answers to this, but you know, in the research there is uh, increased complications when you breach that continuity of care, maybe not breach, but when you break that continuity of care, that is one of the issues that needs to be looked at very closely. And that's part of, I guess, the conversation that the patient needs to have with their prenatal provider. And then, you know, having meetings with the, the provider who could potentially deliver. There needs to be, if you're gonna have that separation, there needs to be some Point where that they all come together to best serve that mom because yes I completely agree and that was one of the points that in research I found that does increase the risk of complications 
And not, you know, not only that, but as a woman, when you're getting ready to have a baby, you want to be in the most safe, secure, trusting, comfortable environment. And I, I believe that that's not what's being fostered when you have to deliver somewhere different with a different <laughs> provider in a different um, place that you're not as, as trusting and comfortable with. I would, do you want, do you, no, you want to say something? <laughs> yeah. I think you could speak to that too. We are, um, I, I, this goes back to the question about the system. We are starting, hopefully, within the healthcare system to understand that healing requires humanity, human touch, human connection, human relationships. Um, and it is very important when you're delivering a baby. This is like, in a woman's time, like this is one of their most vulnerable moments. Um, and so our system needs to try to figure this out. And, and, you know, we are trying to figure this out. How do you continue to provide healing, human connection, relationship, and safety in a technologically advancing very quickly world? Um, and so those two things, trying to like keep those coming together is what, you know, is what the work we're all doing and dedicated to figuring out. I don't think we have figured it out. Um, and when we're, we're, yes, Judy, well, <laughs> we've got to figure it out. I feel like both of you, have, uh, as, as someone who's representing um, the only uh, freestanding birth center in our region that we now have in Asheville, I think both of you uh, have talked about something that when I, I heard earlier is the concept that the only way for truly safe maternity care to be provided safely is in an institution that offers all of those beats and whistles. And I don't believe that. I believe that that is essential to the small proportion of maternity care patients who do have complications or things going on during their pregnancy to indicate that they're high risk. But I think that that's not the majority of maternity patients. The majority of maternity patients are having a normal pregnancy. I understand what that said, babies are unpredictable and you cannot. There is no perfect world. So there will be some of those normal ones that turn out not to be normal. But again, normalcy is 80% or more, 90% of maternity patients are normal, and the environment that they labor and deliver in does not have to be all the beeps and whistles to be safe. And so in many of those countries who have those higher rates of uh, good outcomes in maternity and, mater and baby outcomes, they have a system that does not deliver that maternity care or that, uh, that baby and that mom are not delivering in an institution that has all those groups and pieces. They have a regionalized sort of maternity, triage maternity system where many of those babies are caught not in a hospital, but in a maternity home of some kind. And, you know, in our country now we have birth centers, which kind of encompass that. Unfortunately, their numbers are not what they ought to be, but they're growing. Um, can you respond to that? That is one of the points I wanted to bring up, are what are some of the options thinking outside of the box, you know? So we have this situation where our community hospitals have now, you know, decided we're closing labor delivery. So what do we do other than, you know, voice our opinions that, yes, we need this. As women, we want this and we need this. But some of the solutions are, are telehealth, telemedicine, opening up smaller, safe, comforting birthing centers closer to home for these women. Um, having a doula or a support person if they have to have prenatal care in one location and they have to because they're high risk or whatever the case may be, to travel they have that safe person that's there with them to help decrease their risk because they have that trusting relationship. Um, 
I just think there's so many other things that maybe our community should be looking at. And whether it be hopefully training more nurse midwives, I would love to see that in this area. That's one thing we didn't discuss. We don't have training for nurse midwives close, definitely not in Western North Carolina. I'm not even sure where the closest uh, training center is. But that's something for a very healthy pregnancy and delivery that should be an option for women. Yes. Um, so I wrote down a few things that were said. Um, I live in Spruce Pine, and, um, and our labor and delivery is closing at the end of the week. And um, I keep hearing that maximize, you're trying to maximize impact, not just, um, it's not just about economics. Um, labor and delivery is a Medicaid service. And the region, um, the region is just, we're really lucky here because of the options that we have in working together. Um, multiple layers to these, like there's no easy answer because it's just so complicated, but um, I think, I, I don't know, I, oh yeah, and um, is, is less quality care more available better than that great quality care? And I'm, I'm glad you said that with all the bells and whistles, um, because I had four babies, two in Asheville, and two in Spruce Pine, and no one asked me, but I would without a doubt rather deliver in Spruce Pine, even if I lived in Asheville after the experience that I had, just because I felt like the care was radically different between the two hospitals. As much as there were a million more people doing the jobs, it was so much more personal. There may not have been as much medicine available, there may not have been as many resources available, but I, um, I just, I don't know, I don't feel like the decisions being made are actually checking in with people that have had these experiences and can vote. And I feel like people are voting for us by saying we don't want our daughters to be born under these under these circumstances or and I just I don't know. Yeah. Any response to that? I, I would simply say that um, what I can comment about are the investments and in integration of services that we're attempting to deliver, you know, at, at our hospital. I, I don't know that much about your particular market. I guess I would say, um, and, and in you know the, the Macon County issue, I know about that. What I, you all read in the paper, what we all read in the paper. So. Um, so I, I think that um, just from a perspective of facility planning, whether it's labor and delivery or whether it's uh, a heart center or, or, or whatever the service is, you attempt to balance um, you know, the investment that you have to make against uh, the likely uh, volume of services that you're going to deliver and that's the financial side of it there is some correlation uh, uh, around quality with certain volume metrics not in all cases but um, so so again I don't want to minimize the impact of the absence of services in a particular community on any individual um, we simply try to make the services that we know that we can responsibly and reliably deliver available to our communities. And you know, I can't speak to everything that went into others' decisions around what services would be available in Macon County versus Mitchell and Nancy counties. All, all I can provide is a context for the way we tend to to try to make those decisions, which is to balance the investments required against the populations we can serve, and then you look at, at that across a uh, large spectrum of services that you're responsible for providing to uh, a community, like emergency services, like imaging services, like uh, orthopedic services, and uh, as far as small, small rural communities, I doubt there are many hospitals that can make the investments to you know, offer the same services that a mission can offer in Asheville because of all those demographic 
uh, features. To, to your point about birthing centers, I think that's a, 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 a potentially wonderful solution as things uh, as things evolve. Um, you know, I, I would say that when when I comment about um, investment in certain services, it's really you know it's done within the context of uh, how we evaluate the delivery of those services and quite honestly what our, our consumers are asking us. So I will say that since this um, since this uh, decision with uh, Angel Medical Center, you know, we fielded hundreds of phone calls from patients and interested people and, and uh, you know, folks who are pregnant and folks who are planning to get uh, pregnant and and no one has asked us about well so do you you know what about a birthing center you know in Macon County for example I, I don't have few people know even what a person right is. and so, so they can't ask for what they don't yeah so what so what we have attempted to do is be responsive to you know what what we've been asked to, to deliver and think about the future of how that's going to be delivered or think outside the box sure. and think, oh, you know, maybe maybe our hospital should open a birth center. This is, uh, I got a couple of questions about with, uh, getting these services back. What can what can communities do to get labor and delivery units back into their communities? I mean, I, mean, I don't think any of us could actually speak to yeah. that. Um, I think that the, the um, question that you started with around how to advocate within our state to ensure that women's services are highly valued um, is part of that question. Um, and I do want to also say that, that um, you know, being interested and trying to understand all the complexities and recognizing um, that it isn't an easy fix is part of the answer to that question, but I'm not sure any of us can speak to um, how to get labor and delivery services back in, in these communities. Um, and I 100% I uh, want to thank um, the audience here for, for being able to uh, be here and advocating again for something that you think is really important, which is women's health care. Um, and women should have choices around where they feel most comfortable delivering. And my view is very skewed working um, at a tertiary care center about what I see and what the risks are to deliveries. Um, and so when I think of safety, I think of something um, that may be very different than somebody who works in a birth center. Um, and I think that, again, like advocating for women to be able to have the control and ask for what they feel most comfortable in what setting is part of this big conversation, which is really um, good to be having. I wanted to jump in on a question a minute ago about um, Squeeze Pine to share. If you look at the article that we have today, this is, we didn't put every comment that we received in the article, but there are women who describe an experience that is identical to what you just described. That, and we weren't soliciting this kind of comment, but talking about the impersonality and the lack of um, individualized treatment at the larger hospital and a strong preference for the care that they received at the other hospital. Then they go specifically to maybe you had somebody with a bad attitude. I don't know. Um, but they said exactly the same thing. You're not alone in that. And not, like I said, not every comment got into the story. We heard from several people we interviewed. Uh, for that article, exactly that account. So. Thank you. Dr. Baez, you spoke about um, challenging pregnancies and the kind of struggles with Medicaid there, and I've heard a lot of panelists talk about high-risk cases. Uh, my question is around um, the socioeconomic additional struggles to providing support and care for women who struggle with, say, opioid abuse and give birth to babies who might have exposure. So. You want to, I, mean, I think uh, Western North Carolina has been particularly hit uh, hard by the opioid crisis. Um, the work that is going on around dealing with um, mothers who have opioid use, um, what their options are, and then how to take care of babies who may or may not be affected by neonatal abstinence syndrome 
is a regional team approach um, that Mayhek is very involved with, but it is a it is a team that has to go throughout the entire region of providers, um, pediatric providers, um, hospital systems, behavioral health care systems. It is, a, it is something that is being worked on very seriously because it is impacting our region very significantly. And I, I, again, I think that it speaks to our ability within the mountains to uh, collaborate and have a team approach that is how we will be successful. Um, and I appreciate, every, I think everybody here and multiple people that are in this room and outside of this room are part of that approach. Uh, I have kind of a two-part question. As somebody who works across the region doing outreach and working with families in need, um, I'm, I've talked to so many women who are really scared. There's the women living in Macon County, women living in Mitchell and Nancy County. They're scared about what's going to happen in their future, especially looking at the winter months and, um, and how they're going to handle this shift. Now, I understand that the organization that's closed some of these uh, labor and delivery centers isn't here, but I'm curious, uh, number one, is there anything happening to prepare emergency rooms, to better prepare emergency rooms for women coming in, having babies in an emergency room setting? And then also, you were talking about the continuity of care and how, how impactful that can be on a woman. And I know from personal experience, when you deliver at a hospital that your provider is not a member of, then you see someone else. Are there changes being made to allow some of those physicians to come into a hospital to, to assist their patients in a different hospital setting that they're not a member of? By the way, that organization you mentioned was invited to participate. They elected not to. I will say Mayhex um, OBGYN providers are participating in the education for regional ERs in um, obstetric uh, emergency training. So that is definitely happening. Um, and we are, um, you know, in sh uh, hoping that that, that will benefit um, anybody who happens to have an emergency. Um, again, it's, it, it would be. Um, uh, it, and e preventatively to talk with your provider ahead of time and make a delivery plan, again, that suits your needs um, as a patient with the provider and the healthcare system that works best for you um, would be preferable to um, ending up in an emergency situation in the ER. I actually have a question. So what would happen if a woman presented to an emergency department and needed an emergency C-section? Because I know that you know we have delivered babies in both emergency rooms that I have worked at. I have been a part of those deliveries. But what happens if they need an emergency C-section at a outlying, you know, Spruce Pine or Angel or one of these hospitals that does not have that service readily available? If you read the story that published today, that's how we end the story. When okay. One who oh, showed up this week yeah, at Spruce I mean, Pine didn't know she was pregnant. She was ruptured. Yeah. She had a very complicated situation, yeah. and one of the doctors wrote an impassioned email to the CEO of Mission mm -hmm. saying, I don't want to see patients die. That was me. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> I was the newborn doctor on the call that night. Oh. So it was incredibly scary. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear the outcome. I was so scared for the mm -hmm. The baby is okay. The mom is okay. But it's going to happen. Happen five days from now. I mean, and clearly, Mission Hospital is not listening to any of us. They don't care what the doctors have to say. They don't care what the patients have to say. They don't care what the community has to say. And I've been there for five years. I went to Mayhek residency for family medicine. I did, you know, what they wanted me to do. I went out to this rural community. And now I'm just watching it be torn apart. Sad. And it's very scary, very scary to be a doctor in that area right now. And we're going to lose Dr. Guzman. She delivered both my babies. 
and she's a family practice doctor too. We're losing Dr. Sharp. I mean, I get a call multiple times a day to take on more patients. How many more patients can I see? How many more people, you know? But Mission does not listen. Ron Paulus does not listen. The people who make this decision are making it based on financials only. There's so much information, it's, it's just disgusting. And someone needs to say it. People need to hear it. People need to know what's going on. Thank you so much because you brought up such a great point that, you know, we talked about not being able to train or, you know, not having a, a we have UNC Asheville campus, but how does that situation bring providers in with more responsibility and more liability that doesn't really keep providers wanting to practice in this area? <coughs> So um, I think this is mostly for you, Jack. So I, I sit on a public policy committee of the Henderson County Chain, and, and we talk about, uh, and, and uh, Jim Bunch, if you know, is, is active in the chamber, as is his counterpart, um, Jake Curry. Do we talk about um, how, in, in terms of economic development, we can't, uh, the lack of child care, okay, is a hindrance to bringing in people? skilled people and whatnot. And from your comments earlier, um, the lack of um, maternal care, I guess. Uh, so I see this nexus between the two. I'm just wondering if, uh, if there's discussion. Uh, I haven't heard this so much. I'm wondering if there is discussion in economic development context to, uh, about these issues. I am not part of that conversation, so I can't answer to it, but I think that's an excellent point to bring up that needs to be discussed. Absolutely. Does anybody else have a connection to that from an economic office? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this important discussion today. And I just wanted to ask a question going back to what's happening at the national level about health policy this week in particular is going to be a critical week. And as we are having a conversation about women's health and rural health, preventive care and access to primary care, I wondered if any of the panelists would talk about the critical funding cliff that our community health centers are facing this week, if that funding isn't reauthorized by September 30th, and what that will mean for our community and women's health. So investments uh, in federally qualified health centers was kind of a, a, a big initiative of the Obama administration. And uh, so they're throughout the region. I, I actually don't know how many there are. I know there's one in Silva. I know there's one in Haywood County. And there, there are many throughout Western North Carolina. So I think that... Um, I think this whole discussion that's going to happen this week um, it is incredibly important around, I mean, these uh, FQHCs uh, provide increased access points. They're designed so that there is incremental uh, reimbursement uh, for, for FQHCs um, uh, to treat Medicare and Medicaid uh, patients specifically, which is a a particular challenge in Western North Carolina. So I think it's incredibly important for that funding to be reauthorized. And, you know, again, the, the, the whole discussion that's going to happen this week around, uh, around uh, you know, the, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act and whatever its replacement is going to be, if, if there is one, I think. Uh, I think there are a lot of rural hospitals. We're fortunate that ours isn't one of them, but there are a lot of rural hospitals whose very existence hangs in the balance of that discussion. If Medicaid funding is significantly reduced, which uh, uh, under uh, the, the Graham-Cassidy bill it's supposed to be uh, significant, it will be significantly reduced, if there is if there is a rise in 
uh, uninsured uh, patients across our country over time, uh, access to health care in rural America will not get easier. So uh, it's a really important question uh, that's, that's in part going to be answered one way or the other again this week. <laughs> and it, it's important for uh, local regional hospitals to have strong relationships with their community health center. Um, because, you know, it's just like the discussion we had earlier about how we see this um, sort of response effect when a, a service is shut down in a community, we see an immediate um, uh, protrusion of it in, in, in our hospitals. It's kind of like the, the same thing with um, helping that uninsured population in your, in your community. Um, somebody this, this patient needs help from somebody, and um, if they can get uh, routine primary care at the community health center, that benefits the hospital in terms of um, a patient coming to us at least has had some background of, of primary care. Um, so it is, it is a healthy relationship for the community at large. I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jack, Jackie, that um, also in that is the um, health center teaching grants. Um, so Mayhack has been able to expand the number of residency program um, spots for primary care physicians um, through uh, teaching grants that are specifically designated for rural teaching sites. Um, and that, those numbers are, those dollars are also at risk. Um, in terms of, again, a bit, the ability for us to continue to train providers for our region, we need federal dollars that have designated, that are known to be helpful in that. So I think it's tied into the same bill, but I'm not sure. Any other questions? Yes. Just going back to the sort of advocacy question and what could we do, um, so I think we're hearing kind of two possible explanations for why labor and delivery units are closing. One is safety, and we don't have clear evidence that there's safety, actual safety concerns with these low volume hospitals that have been doing labor and delivery. There's, there's, some, there's some potential concerns about that, um, but we don't have any hard data to necessarily say that these places need to be closed from a safety standpoint. Um, so then we're left supposing that that really is the financial reason, financial forces that have cause these closures. Um, and so thinking about um, advocacy, if this is a Medicaid market, is there any way, knowing that our patients are growing more complicated, and so you mentioned that Medicaid might, might just about cover a really, really low risk patient, but I'm a family doc, I take care of pregnant women, and my average patient has about 10 different diagnoses during pregnancy, from obesity, advanced maternal age, hypertension, diabetes, substance abuse is huge, smoking, so is there some, and, and I know that Medicaid um, is great in North Carolina, and we really have a phenomenal kind of award-winning program looking nationwide, but is there any room I'm looking at my two representatives and senator um, for augmenting that Medicaid delivery fee just in the vein of, like, it feels with these closures like we are choosing to not make women a priority yes. and choosing against women. and. How can we, and if it's, we need to pay doctors and hospitals more to take care of them in pregnancy and labor and delivery, because otherwise hospitals won't do it, because we don't have a county or a city hospital that's a safety net, then maybe that's one potential avenue for advocacy is, is pay more for women to be taken care of. But. Any comments? Yeah, I think that is um, you are absolutely right, but the, my, my big concern is we're actually moving in the wrong direction. Can you talk about an award rating Medicaid system? We are moving to um, eliminate that and replace it with, um, <laughs> sorry, with, with privatized Medicaid. Um, that, is, that legislation has been helped. And I think the real issue and not to, you know so much more about this than I do, but I think the real issue that we have not faced is not, are we not willing to pay for health care for women, but we are not willing, and, and I'm sorry, 
We are not willing to pay for health care for poor people. That is the fundamental problem in North Carolina right now. I can't speak for other states, but I can speak for this state. And when we talk about health care in the General Assembly, we never talk about outcomes. We only talk about money. And, um, and, and uh, the discussion about, uh, over and over again, we heard Medicaid expansion. The fact that we did not take the Medicaid expansion is, is immoral, fundamentally immoral. And I think, you know, if we could have that discussion, at least then we're honest. And we're talking about what our priorities actually are. Um, and so thank you for raising that issue. And that was, uh, for those who don't know, that's Senator Terry Van Dyne, who okay. represents uh, Asheville, Monmouth County, and the state uh, Senate. I'm curious to know how the failure to expand eligibility for Medicaid, how did that, if at all, affect prenatal care? Or access to prenatal care? So most, uh, again, 50% of births in the country are covered by Medicaid. So, so many pre pregnant women actually, um, at some point in their pregnancy, receive Medicaid. Um, the problem is that if you don't have Medicaid expansion, then you're only covering basically at most nine months of this patient's life, at which point you're supposed to try to take care of these 10 other problems that have been problematic before she got pregnant and now trying to deal with them during this very short time frame of incredibly high impact, which is um, good. But it makes it more difficult both before and after her pregnancy for her and her family to actually receive care. And especially in line with health, um, with mental health issues. So, you know, we know that problems don't just arise within nine months of pregnancy. Um, and if we don't have the ability within the system and her primary care provider to establish a relationship with her and a care plan, that's actually preventative, then we end up trying to fix something that's a very hard problem to fix in a very short time frame. One quick follow-up. Early on in a question about single payer, the suggestion was made, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there's rationing going on in the systems uh, or in countries that provide, have single payer. I think we've heard good examples of here how we ration our care as well, mm -hmm. yes. but just in a different way. Uh, it's pretty obvious to me that a lot of different forces are at work that ration care in the United States. Yeah, that's a fair point, and I think uh, to echo the sentiment, I think a lot of care gets rationed to people who are economically challenged to pay for it, and that's uh, part uh, that's central to the debate that will happen this week. There is all of this discussion about which plan covers more people or fewer people, but at the end of the day, the central question is to what extent, uh, and this is at the federal level, but it flows to the states, to what extent does the federal government uh, invest in health care and who is economically uh, morally responsible for the provision of health care to people who are economically challenged. And uh, so that's in the background of all of this debate, but a lot of people simply aren't willing to say it. And one can have whatever position one wants to have, but the question should be asked in those stark terms because the rationing in many cases occurs uh, for people who can't afford care. Right, and people who can't afford it are uh, paying, have to pay. Absolutely. And have to pay higher costs. Yes. That's, that's a result. I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Representative Fisher, and then we'll Hi. Uh, I think uh, I, more than anything today, um, I am struck by the number of women there are in this audience. And um, it, it appears to me that, and I would love to hear an opinion from any of you, about the, the ways that we are stepping backwards in time, in history, where women are concerned. Um, what, 
And my question is, what made it so that we decided that it was OBGYN services that would need to go away? Um, and what, how does this parallel the dark ages of our history when women were not even considered in terms of research around medical care? So we have all these statistics about how men are affected by particular um, uh, illnesses or conditions, but we have very little still about how much women are affected by particular um, uh, health uh, problems. So, uh, you know, I would encourage, you know, you're asking what do we do, and I would encourage every single one of us in this room to vote. You know where the decisions have come from to not expand Medicaid. I mean, if, you, if you've been paying attention, which everybody in this room is obviously very, very much aware of what's going on. If you've been paying attention, then you know. One of the big, big answers to the problem is to vote. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. But I would love to hear from you all about how this takes us backwards in terms of research around women. Um, I'd like to comment on, on that. I mean, so certainly we are not going to comment on another health system's decision, no. but, but generally from um, this gender issue that, that you are, are raising, I was struck when um, the announcement came out back in, I guess, I, May or June or April, I think it was, when um, the uh, services closer to our neck of the woods were going to go away. There was... Um, there was a rally cry from women. Um, some of the mothers had delivered at our hospital, and um, then when the availability of those services became um, uh, known in, in their community, they were able to deliver a second or a third baby in, in, in their community. Those services don't exist anymore, so we're seeing those women come back to us. Apart from that, um, I think that, um, I, I went to a women's college, um, I think that there is um, great uh, strength in um, a, a, a woman's voice, especially at the uh, legislative level, and um, I think that uh, that's going to be an, a, very, a very important uh, voice going forward here, locally, regionally, um, statewide, but most especially nationally. Um, that's where I think um, things have happened where it appears we are um, going back a little bit. And um, I think this is a, a time that uh, we can make ourselves heard on a number of, of issues. This happens to be the one for us um, today. But uh, I, I just wanted to note that I was personally struck by this resounding um, this resonance there in, in our communities from the, the women um, across generations who um, have a, an opinion about this and I think it's something that we're just going to continue to need to, need to talk about. Well with that I want to thank all of you. I'm sorry we're running out of time. So maybe you could answer, you could ask your question afterwards. Sure. Oh, and then I just want to note that we're actually going to be um, have folks. We, we have a bus, and we have sort of um, we're continuing this conversation. So if you want to sort of come and, and continue talking or, or present uh, an argument, um, we're going to be at Twelve Bones uh, Barbecue, and we have like sort of um, we're set up to do like video and audio interviews, and, and we can all talk and mix vibes. It's at the River Arts District. Yes. Right? Yes. yes. Uh, so please join us. Yes, thank you so much to Huffington Post for being, Huff Post, excuse me, Huff Post for being here today. Um, thank you all for sharing your stories, for asking your questions. I hope you'll stay in touch with us as this develops. We'll keep reporting about it. You go to carolinapublicpress.org to read the story today at HuffPost.com. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming and sharing your experiences, your expertise with all of us. And thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so this this has been recorded and it, you'll be able to find it on our website. Okay. <laughs>